This segment is brought to you by Anapsis, the leading provider of solutions to protect ERP systems from cyber attacks. Customers can secure their SAP and Oracle business critical platforms from espionage, sabotage, and financial fraud risks. Visit them on the web at anapsis.com. Looking for a career change? Tenable Network Security is hiring everything from programmers to researchers. Check out all of the available positions at securityweekly.com forward slash tenable jobs. If you're listening to this show, check out the following two positions. Both are technical and both are work from home. Nessus Vulnerability Research Engineer and C Software Engineer. The links to those job postings are in the show notes. Welcome back, everyone, to Security Weekly. Apollo has joined us in studio Welcome, Apollo. Thank you, sir, for being late. Had a yeah, glad bit you of could, a prior engagement. Glad you could be here. But uh, um, I'm here. Apollo has brought not Cuban cigars and not Cuban rum, just for the record. And the not Cuban cigars and not Cuban rum is absolutely fantastic. Um, it's not Puerto Rican <laughs> rum. I'm, I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we want to talk about security for startups. Yes. And why that's hard. Who wants to take that? I mean, I have my own thoughts and opinions, but to be honest with you, no one really cares. So what, <laughs> I want to get everyone oh, else's... Oh, Paul, we love you, man. Well, I want to get everyone else's thoughts and opinions on security for startups. <laughs> Do you want to define a startup for us? Well, that's the thing, too. Do you mean a software startup? you want to define it to software startups or technology startups? Uh, that's another thing, too. It's How hard. You slice and dice it, yeah. <laughs> um, so just personally, I define a startup as... This is a really good definition I saw before. Somebody else said this one. Is a startup is any kind of company that is expected to scale dramatically to, you know, 100 million in revenue. So, for example, you know, the local barbershop, mm -hmm. even though it's a small business, that is not a startup. I got gotcha. you. You're not going to take that and scale that to 100 mm. million in revenue in five yeah. years. That's yeah. just not going to happen. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Um, so, in that regard, you know, a startup doesn't really have to be technology. You know, we're seeing more of the things like the Fitbits coming out, you know, more of these hardware-based startups. Right. And you can also have more service-based ones, too, like TaskRabbit and things like that. Um, so that's my general definition of, you know, massively scaling company. Um, beyond that, though, if for the topics of this conversation, let's say a company that's five years or younger. Mm -hmm. And preferably, if you guys want to be really strict about it, let's even do pre-revenue. You know, you don't even have, let's say you're, you're in seed stage. You don't even yeah. have the VC money. You're getting funding. You're building prototypes, essentially. Yeah, exactly. Prototypes that real people are using. And security, quite frankly, is the furthest thing from your mind at this point. Exactly. So do you guys want to go with that, or do you want to try Let's and go be with like post-revenue or VC? How yeah. should security play in that scenario where you're a startup, you're on the fast track, five years, $100 million company, you're in this stage of getting seed money. Where does security fit in your organization? Does it even fit? Can it fit? Ah, too general a question. Uh, yeah. I suck. <laughs> what can I say? No, look, I mean, the, the question is always the same, right? We, we've had this conversation. Uh, anytime you can design security into the process, it's going to work. The, the question is, what's the problem the startup's trying to solve? What's, what, what, what does the company do? How do they do it? How does security factor into that? And, and does it matter? I mean, sometimes these ideas... They're not great. They don't last. They don't get funding. Maybe mm -hmm. they get funding. They blow through the cash really fast. So the thing, you know, it's funny. Uh, there's a a good friend of mine, Peter Hess. Peter and I uh, talked about this a lot. We called it minimum viable security, right? And it was the idea of the minimum viable product. And so what we did was we looked at the model of startups and we said, all right, startup says ship fast, right? Go Go fast. Get your minimum viable product. Don't worry about all the extraneous stuff. Just run with it. And so we kept we kept pushing. So what's the minimum viable security? What's right? Because the idea is mm. you should start with it in mind. But do you need all this heavy, cumbersome apparatus? No. Okay. What do you need? And and you know, I this it's a concept I'd really love to advance because I I don't have it so distilled out as to all the answers. Um, but there's a minimum set, and I would say you know as we've kind of looked at before, right? Build it or or bolt it on later. Yeah, I don't know. How did you design it? I mean, I think the simpler thing is to say, was security discussed? Was it considered? And and what were the, the implications of whatever you're building down the road? Did you think that through? If so, great. If not, okay, there's our opportunity. Yeah, and the implications and the risk is kind of an interesting discussion. So I think about a company like EcoVent, right? Which not, I don't know them very well. Really cool company based out of Boston. I researched them. 
Um, I considered putting them in my home, actually. They essentially make smart vents for your HVAC system that's forced hot air or, or forced air for air conditioning, okay. right? And they tie into your Nest thermostat. And they automatically... So the problem that they solve is you've got a house that's, you know, I don't know, 1,000 to 3,000 square feet. You've got forced hot air or, or forced air conditioning into every room. Inevitably... Anyone that lives in a house like that can attest. There is one room that you have to wear a winter hat like all year <laughs> round because it's so friggin' cold, whether it's you know winter or summer. The, you know, there's just always a room, and it's a different room depending on the season where you have to bundle up. And then there's a room that feels like a sauna. And usually that room is like the bedroom, right? It's, it's horrible. Uh, it's just because of the way the system works. So they approach the problem from the vent side of it, and they replace mm. all of your vents with embedded devices, essentially, that control mm -hmm. the flow. They all talk to each other on a mesh network, so they maintain the efficiency within your uh, HVAC. They maintain minimum pressure uh, so that it operates uh, uh, without destroying your furnace. And I thought that was a really cool thing. And then I'm like... Be really cool to do security for a company like this because that's really cool. You got wireless, you got mesh networking, you've got all kinds of communications. And um, but how much does security matter to a company like that versus how much does security matter to a company that makes IV pumps? Yeah, I mean, just mentioning the uh, you know Internet of Things kind of products. Mm -hmm. You know, even Nest as well as uh, I'm trying to think of it again. I think it's Insteon. Yep. You know, these guys had a huge hack on their firmware, like, what, four or five years ago. It was in the Wall Street Journal. And the vulnerability was they were using default credentials. So I think in that, if you just do a really quick security assessment of that, you know, what is the worst-case scenario? The worst-case scenario is we have all these products that are on your local network with default passwords, and they're wide open. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so that's happening. Um, what's the worst-case scenario if that is exploited? You know, right. potentially, if I really wanted to be mean, you know, I can get into your local network and I can sit there and sniff your traffic. And I just wait for you to go on to Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, or wait until you go on to uh, Bank of America. Mm -hmm. so. No, let's take it another level because I've, I've actually thought about this in, in regards to Nest. If, if I were able to gain control over your Nest thermostat and you live in Boston and it's January 27th, and you're not there, and I drop the temperature in your house to, you know, whatever, right? I turn it off completely, and your t pipes freeze, and things burst, and, I mean, that, that gets kind of nutty, actually, in terms of the things that can happen. But, you know, it, let's go back to it for a second. But, Mike, there's no profit motive for an attacker to do that, right? We're just talking about destruction at that point. Depends on, I mean, Gosh, I mean, if, if you're looking for somebody who could have profit motive, if you were in the disaster cleanup business, yeah, if or, you were the plumber, a contract, yeah. I mean, like, there are, there are <laughs> yeah, people, and that, yeah, but, you know, and I'd like true. to think we don't get to that point. But, yeah. but so, what happens though is, what, what do you guys, what if you guys educated me on when we look at, at these, these platforms for routers, right, that we keep talking about every week? Mm -hmm. That at first I was like, guys, it's a freaking router. What's the deal? And then Carlos has been leading, really helping me understand those broader implications of the things that can go wrong with it. Okay, cool. So, you know, as as Apollo was just pointing out, I mean, all right, maybe I can just sit on your network now and sniff your traffic. Okay, well, what else could you do? Well, how long do those things have cameras in them? And how long do people start saying, you know what, I'm not going to build my own platform for anything IoT. I'm going to use somebody else's because now I need to mass produce these things. And so we're going to take what I guess we would collectively call a, a weak or an insecure platform. Now we're going to proliferate the hell out of it. Oops. So let's say this right. company is, uh, again, they're, they're getting revenue just from selling the hardware. But they're, they're at, they're, let's say they're a lost leader at this point. You know, they're literally losing money, and they have, you know, their runway, like the Pied Piper guys. Their runway, <laughs> their runway is four weeks. <laughs> yeah. You know, what can these guys do to secure their product? <clears throat> yeah, and, and uh, you know, the thing about it, too, is, you know, I, <laughs> if we say to somebody, right, at the beginning stages of, well, they're like, dude, I'm just trying to control the thermostat. You know, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know what your problem is. Yeah, it's a fair point. And you know what? If they don't get funding in four weeks and they're gone, yeah, all right, got it. But but then the flip side to it is it, it, the challenge that we face in the security industry, we talked about this briefly looking at leadership yesterday. You're either chicken little or, or you're the scapegoat. And if you're chicken little, 
The problem is people don't want to come to you because we get so consumed with perfection. I was reflecting on that a little bit earlier today. In security, we always want it to be perfect. I, you show me that, I will tell you everything that's wrong with it. So if you're a developer or you're a founder of a company and you're hustling hard to convince somebody how this is going to change their life, right? You're This is Shark Tank. You're in front of Mr. Wonderful and Kevin we're, saying, we're gonna is make my money the world you going to die? Place. Yeah, right? <laughs> He's going to say, did place. you just tell me the whole world was your market? Get out of here, right? My yeah. money with you is going to die. So you, you're trying to come up with that. And you get a person in security who goes, well, we should look at all these things and do all this stuff. And how long will that take? Well, I'll only take three weeks. And then I'm going to find all these findings. And I'm going to find all these. Fun- right? Oh, my. They're no. So it's easier for them not to. Because the marketplace hasn't asked for it. The, the, the funding agencies mm-hmm. are not typically asking for it. It's not you a know, requirement. Go, go back to WordPress. It's not a requirement today that your code is checked before right. you call it a plugin. If, if you're a VC today in, with limited, circum, uh, limited examples, you're not looking at it going, well, how secure are you guys? You know, what kind of problem we're going to have later? And by the way, you know, we, I know we already did the news, but one of the reports that came out this week, and, and I, I only looked at the headline – because it wasn't terribly shocking. Most of the big companies that have experienced breaches, it's a blip to their bottom line. Mm-hmm. Yeah. By the way, mm. I, I don't think that that means that we've been defeated. I think what it means is we're placing an inordinate amount of focus on the wrong things. It's, it's a Pareto principle in reverse, right? So the question still comes back to then, yeah, I mean, apologists asked it. So what should they do? They got four weeks. They're running hard. They're running fast. What should they do? But, Mike, it comes down to consequences. And you brought up a good point with Shark Tank. And uh, the consequences aren't necessarily, well, there's going to be security problems. The consequences are, is something bad going to happen that impacts the business? And the best security example on Shark Tank is the guy that went on Shark Tank and pitched the idea of a seat that you install in the back of your pickup truck. Because he's like, well, you know, in the South, everyone rides in the back of the pickup truck, and that's like a thing. He's like, so I made a, a seat that you can actually sit in in the back. And the question the Sharks ask is, What's the liability? And they're like, I'm not going to invest in this because you're going to get sued down the road and be sued out of oblivion. And we don't necessarily make those connections when we talk about technology and software. What if, you know, EcoVent had a problem that would, you know, cause them to be sued? We don't often do that threat model. I mean, the threat modeling for a pickup truck with seats in it's pretty friggin' simple, right? (laughs) The threat modeling for a Fitbit or other some kind of device is is a lot more difficult to envision what could be the consequences. Uh, yeah, well, you know, it's guess. pretty freaking obvious, especially when I'm sitting in the back of my truck and nobody's driving it. But well, yeah, <laughs> it has to be moving, Joff. It's not like a, yeah. Oh, you mean it's not just a place to sit there? And it's have not a like a makeout seat. I mean, maybe if you market it as a makeout seat and like you know it automatically it folds bad. down or somehow makes it unusable when the car's in motion, maybe that would have been a. I would invest it if it was a makeout seat. I guess right. is what I'm pressure saying. Switch. A sp- pressure switch. The yeah, lubrication dispenser. So, so you're dispenser, saying make out you know. seat, you put it in Joff's truck, and you, okay. You guys, yes, I'm saying I want to make out with Joff in the back of his pickup truck. No that was the subliminal it. message I was trying to send. <laughs> I, was, I was picking up a truck. Joff fell for it. I know, I know what it is. I know you miss me. Well, you guys oh. live in the South. You must ride in the back of pickup trucks so, all the time. Oh, so yeah. let's go back, <laughs> let's, let's, let's go back to, to my question then, right? It, it, what's the minimum viable security? What's what is there something that somebody can run through in an hour? Is is are there a set of questions? Mm-hmm. Right, like I think what Peter and I used to call it was table stakes. What's the table stakes? What, what's the level that that you should get to? Because you know this, we we talk about wanting to inspire change. This is how you do it. You you break it down to five things. So wait, so, five, we, so your we VC make PCI what are the five things all these? We make PCI no, please for no, all these. Please don't. No, please. <laughs> well, that's what you're saying. We set the no, minimum bar. No, what I'm saying bar, is we should ask questions. Yeah. So let's, Everybody if you guys want to, I can play devil's PCI. advocate with Mike. I'm going to keep sidestepping PCI. That's all. Just bring it up. Go ahead, Paul. Oh, Jack's not here. Otherwise, we talk about chip and pin. Sorry. Go ahead, Paul. <laughs> so I'll tell you what. I'll play devil's advocate with my startup. You can check it out. It's vinodiscover.com, the place where you can find your wine. Vinodiscover.com. <laughs> so what's your, what, what's your sales? <laughs> I, I had to get I'm a little sales pitch going there. website right now. <laughs> um, so <laughs> full disclosure, I'm in the middle of refactoring this thing right now. So how um, much you have invested? What's your sales? No sales right now. No, I'm, um, I'm not investing. Again, I'm, I'm That's pre, it. I'm pre-revenue right now. You're dead to me. You're yeah, dead yeah, to me, Apollo. My money goes there to die. <laughs> 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 but, uh, yeah, no, that's the thing. My, it's, again, it's my little side project. It's a fun little thing I do on the weekend. Uh, it's been up for about a year and a half now, and I have about 85 users in it. 
not a lot of people, honestly. So if you do want to do some threat modeling against me, what's the most valuable information I have? I got your email. I have a hashed salted. Of course, I like to salt my hash. Of course. You're, um, you're a salty password. kind of guy. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you do. So I have salted hash passwords in there, and I have a little bit of uh, contact information. Sometimes I might have a phone number. So my worst data breach would be losing the customer information. Grand state of five people, let's say it's a couple thousand, but I'm still pre-revenue. Um, beyond that would be you taking control of my server and sending out spam emails or you know doing mm -hmm. something nefarious with it. That's my worst case for me. Um, it's your worst case today. Yeah. But if somebody was, was intelligent and, and, and patient and got embedded with some number of things, what could they do in the future? Because, you know, this is the other thing that happens. Whatever your vision for that is today, when you start getting profitable, when you launch, you're profitable, you're running it like a company, um, you're going to be somewhat responsive to the marketplace. It's because, well, can you do this? And you're like, I let me go find out. Yeah, I can totally do that. And yeah, I can totally do that too. And I, I can totally do that. And now it's not at all what we were talking about today. Mm. Yep. So what's funny, what I've done with mine, just because I'm doing it whatever the hell I want, which is fun, <laughs> is uh, you know I use Kali Linux and I use a system that I contribute to also called Gauntlet. Mm -hmm. um, Gauntlet lets you automate your security scans. So it lets you do things like... Uh, <laughs> Um, Cross-site scripting, SQL map, uh, Garmer, check your cell security. Um, so you let you use all these command line tools. Gauntlet was a firewall back in the day. I was just going to say you're was giving it? me flashbacks. I had flashbacks. Not, not surprised. And that, that was when, it, you, if those of you using Event Policy Orchestrator now, that got introduced with Gauntlet and it automatically rewrote rules and it was a massive automated denial service. Was that a, a McAfee? Or? Network Associates. Network Associates. That's what it was. <laughs> so yes. when I'm teaching wow. my Kali Linux classes in Boston, uh, one of the first classes I taught was saying, you know, every, I'd say 95% of pentesters in the world, they all use Burp Suite. That's, a, that's the gold standard everyone goes to. It's really good system. It crashes from time to time, obviously, if you're kind of pushing it. But Well, it's Java. Yeah, so JVMs. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, every pen tester I've ever talked to, they all use Gauntlet. So what do they do? They say, oh, man, I, ran a, I found a security flaw using Gauntlet. Here's the write-up test. Here's the uh, PDF for it. But I say, actually, take it a step further. Make an automated test out of that. Write me a bash script. Write me a curl command. Because if anything you can do in Gauntlet, it's all HTTP requests. You can do that with curl. Yeah, it's it, tedious. It's, it's dirty. It's interesting. Isn't the NetSparker add up? We just had that conversation with NetSparker. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, you would have you would have had this like light bulb that went off. Oh, yeah, like yeah, probably half an hour ago. Yeah, <laughs> they've taken that to like a whole new, but like what you're saying, repeatable testing. Exactly, yeah. you know, repeatable testing. And what's really interesting and different from other scanners is that this is based on your app, you know, your architecture. It's not saying, oh, we're going to we're gonna do admin admin everywhere. We're going to do pass pass everywhere. It's like, no, 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 we're actually going to pinpoint um, your architecture and your specific flaws. And so you put that into a bash script that you can run or just a raw command line script you can run through Gauntlet. And what's cool is you start doing it like unit testing you would with programming. Unit tests are really simple and really stupid. It's saying pass fail. That's it. So the initial res initial uh, failure tests aren't going to tell you a lot. You got to really dig down and you know prioritize it yourself and figure out what's causing it. Um, generally, if you have a test, you should not be letting that test fail. If that test is failing, you need to reevaluate: is that test still valuable to us or not? Is that test so out of scope? Do you think that startups need to is identify the vulnerabilities? I mean, maybe they don't have the development cycles or the business case to fix them, but at least if they're identifying them, mm. can they understand how large the problem is before they reach a point and say, eh, now may be the time where we can step back and fix some of these things and try and stay ahead of the curve? That might be a viable option for startups. Well, I think one of the things that most startups, again, most developers don't realize, and even <clears throat> sysops people don't realize in small companies is you are always being targeted. That is the reality. When I go through, the easiest way, and I love teaching startups this one, is go through your Apache logs, go through and say, hey, what is our error log saying? Because I guarantee if you go through your error logs, I would love, I'll, I'll try and put mine up on the show notes, I'd love to do this, is I'm getting results that are trying to fuzz for cold fusion attacks. Yeah. I'm getting that stuff all the time. And it's coming from weird places too. It's coming from Kuala Lumpur, Iraq. Yeah, you a know, lot of the it's Russian, Turkish, Estonian hacking groups, they love to deface websites yeah and they just roll the dice man i mean they've yeah. written these custom scanners it's custom code 
and they're looking for one or two specific vulnerabilities, and they're looking at every website for them, regardless of what your architecture is, and they're just you know spraying and praying. Mm -hmm. And when they find one, they deface it. And you see sometimes a big website will just happen to have that vulnerability at that time and get defaced. And that's the thing too. You know, these guys are running those scanners out there. How long until your architecture is targeted? I mean, Christ, what sixty percent of the internet's running PHP? You know, how many vulnerabilities are there? So I would say, first and foremost, that every startup, again, I was at one of the ones that got attacked. Yeah. Um, every startup is being targeted. Sometimes it it's attacked. a published vulnerability. Sometimes it's not a published vulnerability. That's the scary thing. A lot yeah. of times, it's a zero day in a web application. I mean, let's, we talked about WordPress plugins. Dream a lot of WordPress. All look, at, yeah. look at all the WordPress plugin vulnerabilities that are known and how much more we talk about those versus other platforms. And that means that there's probably a lot of vulnerabilities in WordPress plugins that no one's really discovered or just maybe they discovered and haven't disclosed them. Yeah, so, um, sorry, I'm talking too much right now. Yeah, so, um, sorry, we're, just, we're off on a tangent now. I would say... I don't know what we're saying now. <laughs> I would say to, to frame you this... fed me rum and wanted me to speak intelligently. <laughs> rum makes me dumb. Non, Non-Cuban rum, it'll, it'll get to you. It's, yes, it's not a Cuban kind. <laughs> First off, I would say that every startup is a target. That is a fact. They may not realize it. If they check their server logs, spend a little time, they will realize they are being targeted. I've been fuzzed. Um, on my site, if I go through Did my... Did it feel uh, good? Oh, it felt quite nice. <laughs> they, they reached places <laughs> I didn't even realize existed, and I liked it. They reached, they reached deep inside my app. You, felt, you feel vulnerable now. <laughs> Anyways. This is what happens when you come to the end of the show. Exactly. Uh, but yeah, so I'd say every, every startup, every thing you put on the internet is, a, is being targeted. You can find evidence of it being targeted. It's been on there for more than, I'd say, a week. Um, Ming Chow looks like all about this one. He finds this all the time. Um, so once you realize that, you start realizing, you know, what kind of attacks are being thrown at you, then, yeah, security is everyone's responsibility if you have a website that's publicly available. Mm -hmm. And in particular, if it has any kind of even remotely valuable information about your customers, which is kind of the point of a startup, is doing something of value, which means you're going to have something valuable there. And if not, you're going to be able to be, you have customer information there in some form. Yeah. And even if, if it's just passing, passing through it kind even of thing. Just the, even yeah. if it's just the, even the emails. Right. You know, I would hate for those to come out. But <clears throat> so I would say frame it frame the discussion in that context. The second part I would say is by doing security scanning and basically having it automated, you're inherently making your system more robust. More robust to not only attacks, but just weird input. You're gonna get more robust code, more better error handling just from doing that. So that's my, my two cents. Comments okay. from our Skype posts? Well yeah, just it, there's there's something I'm noticing with this. I am tracking with the bulk of what you guys are saying uh, and I understand it technically, but I'm sitting here as a business owner saying, y you guys don't actually expect me to do any of that stuff, right? I mean, that's, that's, and so th therein lies our, our continued conundrum, right? What's, if, we're, if we're talking about startup security, there needs to be something that it's, I think startup security has got to be mindset. I mean, unless you're a security startup, it's a mindset. And the question is, how do we structure that conversation? What are those questions that you ask? And then the, in the investment community, what questions should they ask, right? I mean, is it, should, should they start saying, hey, did you guys run a check? Did, did you guys do analysis? Did you guys do a scan, right? Where do you see it going? Did you guys threat model? I, I don't really know exactly what questions we should ask, but I think it's gotta start simple, right? Three, three questions. What I are the three questions every startup should ask and every investor in a startup should ask. The other weird thing I've seen is because I go to a lot of startups and talk to people in Boston is the common thing I see is when you hit year basically two or three of a successful startup, you have so much technical debt, you're literally falling over yourself. Yeah, that's a good way to, yeah, you have technical debt. You're, you're, yep. I've seen a lot of startups that will say, wow, our technical debt, our just rush to meet deadlines like Mad Men for two years, three years, <clears throat> has gotten the point where we either need to spend like a couple of months not adding new features, which you know no investor wants to hear that, or we need to start from scratch. And I've heard stories on both sides of doing that. Uh, but I would say if you did security early on and you do really good unit testing and really good edge case testing, which again is part of security testing, underflows, overflows, you know, null pointer exceptions, things like that, then you won't have to deal with that problem later. So my only comment is your your site looks really pretty cool, actually. <laughs> well, Thank you. It works on mobile, too, by the way. It works on your phone, your tablet, and uh, desktop. It's responsive and all that fun stuff. Yeah, nice. And it's running Apache, jQuery, Google Analytics. And <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. 
But, well, cool. uh, uh, Apollo, thank you very much for coming down. No, um, thank you. Running a little short on time. What we're going to do now is we're going to segue. Uh, Apollo's going to make some drinks. It's kind of a very special segment. Um, we set up a hey. bar shot. It's an awesome bar shot. And Apollo's going to walk us through making a mojito. Yep. Just oh, bonus my content. My favorite summertime Mike. drink. Yeah, there you bonus go. content. Yeah, that, you don't, you don't actually need a headset the over there. It's all, all mic'd right. up and ready to go. So talk us through making a mojito. That's See, what now do. when you say that, you gotta, fun. you're going to have to start calling me Michael, which is what most okay, people call so, me, and not Mike. Because you know, if he's all mic'd up, that just sounds weird. Uh, fundamentally, oh. it is a lot of Okay, mix. Michael. I can't, I can't really hey, thank hear. You so can, much I, can you hear you Apollo? I can't hear Apollo. <laughs> oh, no. I can try Apollo. and talk oh, really, no. really loud. <laughs> I can't hear him. I can't hear him. Plug the cable. We might not be sending his channel to the headphone amp, but. Tech, tech, phone a friend. Uh, the problem? <laughs> no, I don't think it's a gain thing. I don't think you're sending his channel the headphone app is what I think. All right. Okay. Test. Test. Okay. Test. This is oh, totally sure. excellent. Test. Um, I definitely can't hear him. Test. Test. You guys good? Can you hear him, Chris? Okay. How are you guys? Anything? Okay. Anything? Can the, can the video yeah. hear him? I don't know. <laughs> Anyone? That's very non-specific. You've got a camera Test. over there, right? Paul, because all I can see is you. Test. Yeah. yeah. Test. Can you guys hear Apollo? Test. Oh. Test. No. Test. No. No. Test. 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 Unless he's being very Test. quiet. Test. You don't know any poems? Test. Lorm, ipsum, com, solar, dolit, it, mitsum. You guys got anything? <clears throat> Hold on. Test. Hold on. Test. Hang on, viewers. Test. 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 Can I have a short break here for a moment, viewers? Please be calm and hack naked. You're going to listen to the musical stylings of... Michael Santa Calendula. Oh, no. Oh, no, I think Josh should do it. <laughs> Carlos. Carlos can regale us. Uh, I got a knife. You guys got me now? Yeah. Am I coming through? Yes. Okay. All right, so you guys right. ready to do this? In a moment now, we're going to get audio from Apollo. Oh, no. Okay. His so audio is going to work. What goes into a Apollo, what's mojito? your creed? You guys good? We don't hear Apollo. We, good to go? we cannot hear Apollo. Anyone? You guys good? Oh, Apollo there he 13. is. Let me know. I'm good when you are. Oh, I hear him now. Okay. Oh no, Apollo Creed right. 13. I can't He's hear here. anything over here. That's okay. You, you won't. You won't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can hear you. So go All right, for it. Here All we right. go. So cue Apollo. <clears throat> so uh, mojito is actually a very traditional uh, Cuban drink. It starts with uh, nice, either a white or a brown rum of some kind. Uh, I prefer brown rums generally, but white rum is good if you want a little lighter flavor on it. Next, you have mint. This is the heart of your cocktail. Final part of it, a little brightness, is your lime. So when you're starting out, you want to grab your mint. And you'll like this one, Paul. You got to make sure you give the mint a nice spanking. You got you to you get in there and really let it, know, let it know what's happening. So the first thing you got to do when you're doing your mojitos is get some fresh mint, preferably. You, know, you don't want this mint lying around. If it's growing in your backyard, <laughs> you can give it, tell you what, I'll do, I'll do two of them. I'll do one with black rum and I'll do one with white rum. You can compare them. How about that? All right, so, so uh, if, you're growing, if you're in New England and most parts of America, you can find mint growing wildly. Give it a try. Give it a taste. You know, you, but you'd be surprised. The mint family includes things with, uh, obviously, traditional mint as well as spearmint and peppermint. So... You can also get variations of that, you know, spearmint, peppermint kind of flavors. And they're very, very good, but they bring interesting uh, characteristics to it. So anyways, get some mint, make sure it's fresh, and don't be stingy. I would say go anywhere from six. If you want to be really generous, go with 12 different little sprigs. Now, there's two ways of doing it. One way of doing it that a lot of people like to do is they'll get the muddler, they'll throw it in, and they'll muddle it inside the glass. Now, the one thing about that is you don't want to be too aggressive with the muddling because these are plants. They do have chlorophyll in them. And if you muddle them too much, you're going to get a lot of that chlorophyll, a lot of that kind of astringency to it, and you really don't want that. So if you do muddle it, you know, just kind of get in there 
Don't be too much, you know. Literally, that's it. You just want to kind of break up the leaves just a little bit and release some of the essence. When you do that, you will smell it. So that's a good sign that you're off to a good mojito. That's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it, which I've seen more down south, which is really fun, is you get another bundle of it and you uh, spank the mint. Basically doing the exact same things that you're doing your hands. So you get a nice big bundle like this and you kind of go, that's it. Nice and spank the mint. So throw that in there. Just needs one That's step spank. one. Step two, you want to get some ice. Preferably, this should be some kind of uh, crushed ice. Now, the reason you're doing that is uh, normally you can serve these in, obviously, rocks glasses like these, or you could do uh, a mint mojito, um, I'm like a mint julep cup, which is usually stainless steel, uh, pewter, or silver. And that's going to have a lot of heat diffusion, and it's going to be melting the ice. Um, so for this one, I'm just going to use regular ice, because what we got on hand, we don't have any crushed ice. And you want to be generous with this. You really want to get that in there. You know, this is a nice summer cocktail. It's supposed to be refreshing. So get that in there, fill it to the top. Now, we're going to do two different ways here. We're going to do one with white rum, and we're going to have uh, Paul do a little taste test on this one. Looking for the jigger. Has he got a jig? All right, there we go. So we're going to do one shot of white rum. Throw that in there. Oops, spilled a little bit there. Can also do it with black rum. I personally prefer with black rum. I would say find any kind of rum that you enjoy sipping on by itself and throw it into mojito. Um, it's just it's a really good cocktail to experiment with because the mint and the lime will not overpower your rum. If anything, it'll uh, accentuate it. So really go for that characteristic. Next up is we're gonna get the lime. I'm gonna do this. Oh yeah, Paul, do you have any uh, simple syrup? Yeah, there's a gobby nectar right over the bar. Agave nectar. You got some for me. Where is it? All right, cool. I found it. All right. This is the last part. Yep. So we're going to get our lime here. Now, this is actually personal preference. If you want to have a very bright, very acidic cocktail, you could actually use half a lime. I generally don't go that far with it because we're doing one shot of liquor to this. Is I will do half a lime that will squeeze in. So this is a quarter of a lime. And I'll use another quarter of a lime as a nice garnish. So one thing I like to do is I cut, the, cut it down the middle and give it a nice, uh, nice little rim job there. Kind of get around the edge. So that way, as you're drinking the cocktail, you'll be constantly tasting on that on the sip. So we get that going. And because I only rimmed it with that one, I'm going to squeeze that in there. Going to give that a nice rim of the juice. And finally, we're going to take some, this, we're using agave nectar, which I really suggest because agave has a lot more characteristics, a lot more complex flavors than just this regular simple syrup. You can find it in the grocery store, tastes great. Um, it's more of a preference, you know, you can put a ton of simple syrup in here if you really want to. I like to give it just kind of a nice little drizzle. So it's a 50-50 mix. Um, yeah, so with this one, I would say, honestly, you're probably going to put it in like a quarter of an ounce or a third of an ounce. Um, I just kind of spray it in there, kind of doo 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 doo. All right, get that. Get a nice mixing spoon here. Kind of go in there. Give that a nice mix. All right, that's looking pretty good. And then finally, your final garnish. You want to get a nice piece of mint, uh, usually more of the end tail pieces. And kind of throw that on top. And there you go. That is a very fine mid julep. So, Paul, here we go. So we have, so we got the white mint, the white mojito, and the black mojito. Security and how to make mojitos. All that on this edition of Security Weekly. Thanks, Apollo, for coming down back again in studio. Thanks, everyone, for watching. And uh, cheers. cheers. Over and out. <laughs> cheers, everybody. Mm, yummy.
Wow, that's really good, dude.